Okay, we are all. I see it's one thirty, and it's time to start our uh, last but not very least uh, session dedicated to the commercial determinants of cancer prevention and care, which will be, <clears throat> which is hosted by the Bolcho Euro Regional Office and will be moderated by Dr. Robert Martin. Uh, with this, uh, Dr. Martin, please the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Yulia. Can everyone hear me? See me? I can hear you well and see you well. <laughs> All right. I hope so everyone else can too. Then wonderful. All right. Cancer in crisis from conflict to commercial threats, understanding the lived experiences and commercial determinants of cancer. So welcome. My name is Robert Martin. I'm based at the Alliance for Health Policy and Systems Research. We're a WHO hosted partnership in Geneva and it's Really my pleasure to, to welcome all of you to this session, uh, the last for today during the London Global Cancer Week. Um, in our discussion today, we're gonna focus on the commercial determinants of cancer prevention and care. And we have four fantastic speakers, um, Gordon Galea, Marilise Corbex, Richard Sullivan, and Monica Kosinska. I'll introduce each of them individually, but but maybe just before we do that, a few quick housekeeping points. So I think um, you might have already seen the notification the system, that this session is being recorded. Um, we will have time at the end uh, for questions and answers. So feel please feel free to ask any questions you might have through the question and answer the chat function. Um, also, just to give a little bit of context to say that this discussion uh, really comes out of some work that the WHO Euro Cancer Team commissioned in 2022, um, which led to a Euro Health special issue on commercial determinants of cancer control policy in collaboration with the observatory and the WHO HQ commercial determinants team. And I think we'll, we'll make sure that that link is in the chat. Um, so to get us started and, and really to open this session, give some context, I'll, I'll sh pass the floor shortly to Gordon Galea. He is WHO Euro's strategic advisor to the Regional Director's Special Initiative on NCDs and Innovation. Um, he previously worked as WHO's WR, uh, the representative, WHO's representative to China. He's worked in a number of other roles in and across WHO, and he was also an author of, of one of the papers in that special issue. So Gordon, if you're there, over to you. Robert, I'm, I'm afraid um, Gordon is not there. Uh, he has oh. probably some connection issue or is not available. Um, so maybe he can speak, you know, later and, okay. and continue with the program. That sounds no problem at all, Marilise. Thank you very much. You've you've already jumped in. Then allow me to introduce you. You are the uh, senior technical officer on the WHO Euro Cancer Team. And if I'm not mistaken, you are going to give a, a short presentation, an introduction to the commercial determinants of cancer prevention and care. Maybe we can just hear from you, your presentation, and then if Gordon uh, joins us, uh, we, we can have some of his reflections maybe thereafter or at the end of today's session, uh, depending on his availability. Does that sound good, Marlies? Are you you ready uh, to, to share your presentation? Your yes intro that's fantastic yeah. okay then please go ahead can do that. um do, do oh, you wait uh, marilise actually sorry i see uh, gordon has joined us now gordon are you oh, there excellent excellent yes uh greetings Wonderful. my uh, i discovered i had a registration link rather than a panelist link so <laughs> i frantically in the last uh, few minutes a couple of minutes trying to register and get myself on. Okay, <laughs> apologies. Excellent. Good. Well, big welcome. I, I actually just introduced you a couple of minutes ago, um, but very happy to have you with us here again. And we're very uh, much looking forward to your kind of introduction, your uh, setting the scene, giving us some context uh, for the, this important session today. So without further ado, over to you, and then we'll come to Marilise next. 
Thanks, uh, Robert. Thanks, uh, colleagues on the panel and uh, the 62 participants that I see online. Um, you uh, can probably see on the side that blurry 96. It reminds us that we are only 96 weeks away from the UN high level meeting on the fourth UN high level meeting on non communicable diseases where all countries uh, working on non-communicable diseases will be held to account, are we able to deliver on our commitments made uh, as uh, the nine voluntary targets on the way to Agenda 2030 and the Sustainable Development Goals. Many of the barriers holding us from getting there are linked to corporate interests. And in the area of cancer prevention and care, we find that across the whole continuum uh, from uh, prevention, <clears throat> from risk reduction through to early detection, screening, treatment and palliation, there are care providers, uh, medicine manufacturers, diagnostic and treatment technology companies, uh, promoters of screening who all have a, uh, a direct financial interest in, in the uh, process of uh, both preventing and treating cancer. In the current uh, Europe, one in three Europeans will experience cancer, uh, meaning that the whole cancer field is a lucrative market for these corporate actors. And if we look at Statista Global, uh, the revenue of non-pharmaceutical technologies alone is estimated to be over $380 million per annum, projected to rise to uh, $600 billion by 2024. And in the, despite the fact that the revenue for other medicines has uh, over the decade after, since, uh, for the years since 2010, the revenue for other medicines decreased by 18%, the cancer medicine revenues rose by 70% over the same period. I am a recent cancer survivor and I am very grateful to the industry. I owe literally my life, I am alive and speaking here because of the industry's positive contribution to cancer survival. <laughs> I'm living proof its contribution is indisputable. In recent years, a range of new cancer medicines have significantly increased cancer patient outcomes. However, there's also evidence that the industry actively shapes regulations. It shapes health policy and shapes the public research agenda in favor of profit making, sometimes at the expense of health. The negative influence of the private sector affects the whole cancer continuum. We have the tobacco, alcohol, and processed food companies that influence policymakers and manipulate consumers. These affect prevention. While some innovative drugs have delivered very substantial benefit, an increasing number of drugs are delivering only marginal benefits, unclear harms, and yet very high prices get and get market authorization affecting affordability and quality of care. And the whole debate about value-based pricing of medicines that affects everything from antibiotics to uh, uh, cardiovascular treatments is very much at stake here in uh, cancer. There's a new wave of screening procedures that's promoted by the private sector with aggressive marketing methods, including direct to consumer advertising and astroturfing, drawing in pseudo uh, patient organizations, which represent a, a fake grassroots voice um, to reinforce the inclusion of, of drugs 
in essential medicines list or that justify the value-based pricing as determined by the industry. So there is here a big dilemma. We cannot achieve the sustainable development goals and notably the reduction in cancer mortality without addressing the commercial determinants in reducing risk in increasing accessibility of medicines in providing the appropriate care uh, that people need that is evidence-based. So we, in the broader sense, we also need an economy that serves the uh, what we are calling increasingly frequently the well-being economy that redefines what we understand by value, value creation, value extraction, uh, value-based pricing, including people's health and well-being um, as being fundamental to the economy, not just um, measures of productivity and shareholder value. These are political choices that we hope to introduce you to during this webinar. So what to do? We need to have a better understanding of commercial determinants and how they influence the area of cancer prevention and care. And one of the uh, one of the points of pride is that our team is identifying th this area of commercial determinants also in the management, not just in the risk reduction continuum, a parts of the NCD continuum. There is a complex set of techniques, power dynamics, interests at various levels, from influence at national level to the global influence of transnational corporations. And as we better understand these, we need to address them at all levels, including, I say again, appreciation for the contribution that many companies are making to improving uh, the management and the, in, and the survival for, of uh, people with cancer. A first step, though, is to raise awareness in the cancer community, as we are trying to do today, as individual clinicians, activists, academics, policymakers, each of us can play a role. And the first step is to educate ourselves about commercial determinants, that determinants and a second one is to be watchful. Health professionals that are caring for cancer patients need to be watchful primarily to the marketing approaches, the marketing of drugs, the marketing of screening and medical devices that influence care practices. Policymakers, opinion leaders, NGOs and patient associations need to be watchful as they are often key targets to efforts to influence policy and regulation. We have tried to summarize much of this in a special issue of the EuroHealth Journal on commercial determinants of cancer control that I'm sure will be uh, shown and referred to repeatedly in this uh, webinar. And I would suggest that for those who to whom this new subject is new, could do far worse than have a glance, at least at the abstracts, if not the whole journal. All the people presenting today have participated in this issue, and I want to thank the authors who are involved in this publication and who are speaking today, such as Richard Sullivan, Monica Kozinska, who runs uh, our commercial determinants program globally and is our uh, WHO headquarters leader in this field, and Marilise Corbex, uh, who coordinates the cancer program inside uh, our team in Copenhagen, as well as Maria La Sierra, who contributed a lot to both the publication and the present webinar. For maybe the slightly overlong opening, but I hope it sets the scene, uh, and for your attention, I thank you. And back to you, Robert. Excellent, Gordon. Thank you very much for that very powerful opening. I think you've you've done an excellent job of setting the scene. Um, I really appreciate the reminder of ninety six weeks to uh, is it September twenty twenty five at the uh, UNGA high level meeting. I I think that's extremely important. 
I'm also grateful. I think all of us are thankful uh, that that you're with us, uh, that you are a cancer survivor, and um, but I think you also highlighted some of the challenges, right? And I think um, you know we 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 all appreciate are grateful for the industry's contribution in life saving, uh, life continuing medicines and drugs, but we also recognize that there are some concerns, some some challenges. Um, in the ways in which the industry engages to shape uh, policy process, uh, the way they exert power. And I think that's what we're here today to discuss, to illuminate, and, and ultimately, hopefully, to address. Um, so thank you again, uh, Gordon. Okay, so now we are very happy, I'm very happy to introduce uh, Marilise Corbex who is the senior technical officer in the WHO Euro cancer team. Um, Marilise is gonna provide an introduction uh, going into more of the details on the commercial determinants of cancer prevention and care. So Marilise, over to you. Thank you, do you see my presentation? We do, and we're very much looking forward to it. Thank you. Okay, thanks. So, um, as Gordon said, uh, there is one European out of three who will develop cancer in his lifetime. Um, in the world, it's uh, 19 million uh, people who will be uh, diagnosed uh, with cancer each year. So, you can think of uh, uh, cancer as a big uh, market for um, this uh, commercial determinant, uh, uh, commercial actor we want to speak about. So a commercial determinant of cancer, what does it mean really? Uh, the, com the definition of commercial determinant of health is that it's the private sector activity that affect the health of, um, of population. So who are these people? The industry, as I go and explain, are also the medical service providers subject to financial intensive, such as the basic private practitioner, the biological um, uh, private laboratory, uh, the private hospital, etc., and they can um, influence positively or negatively uh, health of population. And of course, today we focus more on the negative side, and we focus all along the cancer control continuum, so which is from prevention to palliative care. So for prevention, the commercial actor we focus on is like, you know, the so-called big tobacco, alcohol, big food, the oil industry, the chemicals, the um, sunbed uh, beauty industry, etc. While for early detection, diagnostic, treatment, and palliative care, it's more the pharmaceutical industry, the medical device and technology um, industry that uh, create machine, test, um, and so on. And this uh, medical service provider subject to financial intensive. Uh, incentive. So, so um, let's um, see where we come from because we see this commercial determinant growing. And in fact, um, since the 80s, there is a clearly um, a decrease of um, the, the, the figure on the left show this decrease of public wealth, which is like um, income of countries, the taxes. Uh, plus their assets, so land, uh, buildings, minus their debt. And you see that for many countries today, uh, it's even below zero, like for UK, uh, Germany, France. And uh, while the private wealth is increasing uh, uh, since, uh, since the 70s, 80s. So there is a power imbalance. And on the right, you see also the most, um, the 100 most uh, rich entities uh, in terms of income. So the income is the, the tax for the state and the revenues for the, no, in terms of revenue, the revenues for the, um, the companies, the state are in black, the companies are in red. And you see that among the 100 richest, 70 are companies. So United States and China are the richest, but you see that uh, Switzerland uh, or uh, India or Norway are somewhere in the middle. Uh, so why we got at our little level interested in this commercial determinant in WHO? Because we have uh, more and more scientific evidence about uh, what are the best cancer policy. We have more and more cost effectiveness data. So we are able to go to countries and make excellent WHO recommendation that people don't follow. And why that? 
we first question ourselves. But then, uh, we by inquiring more, we found that commercial determinant can be quite a lot uh, behind. So what we see in countries, this growing infatuation in all kinds of cancer screening, uh, even when they are useless, even when they are harmful, um, and preferentially with very expensive screening machine or screening test, we see a skyrocketing uh, rocketing price of cancer drugs, and these costly drugs are preferred by the oncologists, and they are covered by the health insurance, even if you have like uh, alternatives which are cheaper. We see a uh, big enthusiasm for any kind of new machine, surgery robots, screening vans, even when there are clear evidence that they do not significantly improve outcomes. So we try to understand why all this comes from. And that's when we uh, approach a lot of uh, brilliant, uh, few brilliant minds, some of which uh, we present today, to understand that uh, better. And it uh, results in this Euro Health special issue on commercial determinant of cancer control policy, where there are eight articles, and I will um, try to summarize them. So going back to prevention, um, you know, there are very known, well-known uh, policies, uh, so-called WHO Best Buy, which can improve the situation, like uh, uh, improving, uh, increasing the price, notably through taxes, decreasing avail availability when and where you can uh, buy alcohol, uh, decreasing marketing, you know, like uh, doing plain packaging for tobacco, labeling of, um, of alcohol and um, and processed food, product uh, reformulation, you remove trans fat from your uh, food, it's already be, be, begin to be better. But uh, all this that the government could put in place, they are very strongly um, pushed back by the industry using different tactics. And uh, Gordon made an excellent article about these tactics. There is a fear of, uh, you know, uh, saying it would have terrible impact on the economy, on the employment in the country, uh, fear of lawsuit also. Um, these entities have a lot of funds to, uh, to fund politicians to support them, but also media, sport, culture, to gain uh, support. They do uh, so-called uh, uh, whitewashing. Um, they fund or even create, and that's uh, astroturfing, this word means uh, creation of fake uh, NGO. Um, such as, you know, a smoker right NGO. Uh, they fund this front group to provide seemingly independent lobbying. You know, they, they ask, for example, the, the hospitality industry to, uh, to stand um, up with them to say that, uh, to uh, ban um, uh, tobacco in a restaurant will be, uh, will be terrible for the hospitality industry. They, they deny, they decrease the impact uh, of their product on cancer risk. They fund alternative research so, so to create multiple expert opinion, uh, which from uh, some benefit uh, their, uh, their product. And um, they also use deflection. For example, they focus the prevention dialogue all on consumer and people responsibility. Um, so, so called like, uh, for example, um, uh, harmful uh, um, consumption of alcohol, meaning that maybe there is a consumption of alcohol that is not harmful. Uh, so to divert the attention from the industry responsibility. Uh, so that is for prevention. Then for screening, we see this increase if uh, infatuation is screening. And um, it's partly due to the fact that companies promote more and more aggressively screening tests and machines, that in included directly, directly to consumers, the people, also to, um, to doctors to create demand. They use a method like uh, more and more like the pharmacy, using ghostwriter to write articles that then are um, signed by uh, much uh, more uh, known scientists. They publish only the positive result, never the negative one. They are also funding an astroturfing of um, patient organization. Uh, we will uh, provide their um, uh, we will provide independent lobbying. Uh, the fact that also in our world there is more and more uh, private service provider compared to health public uh, provider. Um, this also increased the, um, the infatuation for screening because screening is a large market for a private service provider. For example, uh, in um, in EU country, PSS screening is an important source of revenue for private urologists. So, uh, despite there is more and more evidence against opportunistic screening and against uh, non-evidence-based screening, like, uh, you know, ultrasound of the belly, for example, to find if you have a, 
anything there, this practice increase. Um, so there is also uh, allocation of research funds, which become more biased toward the new technology, like a blood test for cancer, at the expense of improvement in care delivery. And that's a problem that is found also at the level of medicine and uh, medical device. So I, I will uh, rapidly summarize these two articles because uh, uh, Richard Sullivan will speak much more uh, about it after. So the, we see also this research funding hijacked. Um, you know, the public funds go to finding uh, innovation in medicine and medical device and not in uh, public health, uh, in uh, health system research, for example. There are clear evidence that companies, in fact, influence all the ecosystem, not only the research, uh, but also market authorization. They influence the clinical guidelines. They influence the prescription practice of the, um, of the oncologist. Um, as a result of uh, this influence on uh, research and market authorization, the bar for uh, putting medical devices on the um, on the market are low. Well, they are always been low, but they stay low. And uh, the one for drugs are decreasing, resulting in development of low value and low impact products. Of course, there is still uh, some excellent drugs that are produced, but it's uh, it's unfortunately a quite small percentage of all the drugs that are produced. But you can be sure that the costs are uh, huge for all these drugs, whether they are great or not so great. And as a result, what we see in countries, and including uh, low and middle income countries, if, very much is an overspend on low impact drugs and technologies and underspend on basic high impact uh, drugs and technologies, but also cancer control measures so such as uh, early diagnosis pathway, patient navigation, and so on. For palliative care, it has also uh, this commercial uh, determinant also have an impact because um, what we see is that much too many patients are treated as long as possible, even if it's detrimental to them. Um, some US uh, studies have shown that it's in the two last week of life that the cost on treatment is the highest. Well, no, you should be on palliative care at this time. And the um, quality of life is, is, is much lower when you uh, continue to treat until the end. Um, compared to if you uh, ensure good palliative care. Of course, there is also marketing of new expensive analgesic, which are not at all superior to old uh, affordable uh, opioids. And uh, just an example, if you know about the opioid crisis, that's a good example of commercial interest setting the clinical agenda. So the story is that a pharmaceutical company in the US aggressively market an opioid for non-cancer pain, like everyday pain, almost, pretending there was no addiction and recommending to increase the dose when the opioid effect fade away. So this was uh, uh, quite uh, some time ago. And in 2020, it was estimated that the opioid crisis had killed half a million people by overdose in the US. So there was regulatory intervention to curb this crisis. And uh, as a good side effect, it has led to reduction in opioid use among cancer patients and corresponding increase in emergency room visits. So benefits on all, as, on all sides. So uh, is there a solution to that? Many, and uh, Monica will tell you more uh, today uh, about it. But as uh, Gordon said, a very important one is to raise awareness to raise awareness among doctors, to better resist all kinds of marketings among government, EU officials and NGO, to better resist the lobbying, uh, because they are uh, the main target for, for it. Uh, among the public also, to foster uh, consumer uh, activism, you know, boycott some, um, some food products, for example, because uh, they are not good for health, but also employee and shareholder activism within this company who do not uh, behave uh, very ethically. Um, there is a lot of uh, quite successful um, example of that, especially for climate change, but also for uh, you know general ethical behavior. Uh, we need stricter regulatory standards at all levels, of course. Um, and that's a difficult uh, agenda, and I think Monica will tell you more about it. Transparency also is uh, an important word, uh, transparency about uh, real benefits and harms of uh, an LC commodity, of screening. The harms of screening are very, are very um, unknown from most uh, professional and decision maker. Uh, drugs, medical device, technology, transparency. And uh, the transparency about um, research and development cost of drugs is also an um, important um, weapon against uh, 
um, a very high price. And we need better protection from all kinds of influence for public decision-making bodies, uh, stronger conflict of interest rules at all level, regulation of lobbying. For example, at the EU, there is a lobby register where lobby can, if they want, register, but it could be mandatory. Uh, we need to, pro break, uh, to protect our uh, public research uh, agenda for uh, the from the um, the industry um, interest. Protect our health insurance. Uh, you know we uh, we see experts paid by the industry in reimburse commission uh, reimbursement commission for um, for drugs in uh, in Belgium, and that that should stop. For example. And at a more uh, philosophical uh, level, we can see that uh, we are in a pathological economic system that allows and sometimes even push for corporations to go arms because they need to deliver a maximum money to share or shareholder. And that's maybe when it's time to rethink the role of economy. It should serve the people, including people's health. It should not be like the people are there to and their health to serve the economy. It should be the opposite. Uh, thanks for your attention, and here, uh, thanks to Golden, you have the QR code to your um, publication that I recommend to, of course, to read. Thank you. Super, Marlies. Uh, thank you very much for that very uh, in-depth overview, introduction to the commercial determinants of cancer prevention and care. We really enjoyed the kind of overview, the, the challenges uh, across the kind of continuum of care how you illuminated, brought a spotlight um, to some of the industry's tactics and the playbook in which they, they use to further their interests, uh, create myths, and, and generally inhibit regulations. I think you've identified some of these conflicts of interests. You've begun uh, to stimulate uh, some thinking on how we might be able to respond to this. So thank you very much for that, uh, I think, extremely useful uh, introduction. Um, at this point, we're now going to move to Professor Richard Sullivan. He is a professor of cancer and global health at King's College in London. He is the director of the Institute of Cancer Policy and an NCD advisor to WHO. He also happens to be the author of two articles that were published in this Euro special issue, which I think you have the link in the chat. And so, uh, Richard, over to you. Very much looking forward to your thoughts, uh, your presentation on the commercial determinants of cancer medicines and non-pharmaceutical technologies in cancer. Over to you, Richard. Robert, wonderful. Thank you so much. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to give you a sort of quick 15 minutes canter through um, some of the work that I co-authored with two friends and colleagues, uh, Chris Booth from Kingston in Canada and Ajay Agarwal um, here with me at the Institute of Cancer Policy and London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Um, and I guess to situate this in the broader topic of today, this is really another aspect of the human crisis in cancer. Um, it's about sustainable affordability. That's really what we're getting at today. And interesting, and in, in this is actually part of a major commission, the Lancet Oncology is taking forward, led by Gary Roden, which will be coming out next year. So let's begin with the business of cancer medicines. Let me be blunt. The pace of innovation complexity is absolutely unrelenting um, in all aspects of cancer medicines and accompanying biomarkers. And, and to give you some idea here, um, prior to 1995, we were talking about 40 new cancer medicines had been introduced in the previous decade. Between 95 and 2018, we saw 180 new cancer medicines receiving EMA approval and 164 new indications. This, this is absolutely huge. And if you look at the immuno-oncology market and what's happened is we're seeing an absolute explosion. And it's not just what's happening in the West as well. Work we've done looking at what's going on in China is showing major powers like China now piling into the market with developing new forms of biologicals in immuno-oncology. So the number of these sorts of products coming onto the market is absolutely unrelenting. And why has this been such a powerful commercial determinant? Well, the bottom line is this. Cancer essentially saved global biopharmaceutical business model. Some amazing work that was done that was published called Breaking Zeroms Law showed that the number of new molecular entities per billion US dollar of R&D spending was plummeting until 2010. 
And then the era of molecular targeted anti-cancer agents came along, followed obviously by immunology. And that absolutely reversed the fortunes of pharma. Suddenly, for the expenditure of R&D, they saw this enormous increase in products coming through to market. And this is, of course, driven mainly by the U.S. market. I mean, you'd see there the numbers, 45 to 50 percent of the world market by value for oncology is in the USA. The global oncology market now is worth over half a trillion dollars and growing. And we're talking about a compound annual growth rate of 13 percent. These are stunning commercial figures. And some work we recently quietly buried, <laughs> frankly, in, a, in another paper showed why. If you look at the R&D return on investments, the return on investment on oncology drugs, and this is pre-immuno-oncology era, we're talking on average 551%. A dozen cancer medicines have return on investments of between two and a half and three and a half thousand percent. So from a commercial perspective, and bearing in mind this excludes immuno-oncologists, these numbers are going to be massive when we redo this work. This is a huge global financial ecosystem. And as Marilise has already pointed out, and Gideon as well, that the commercial terms now are really shaping regulatory and public ecosystems. Commercial drivers are dominating clinical trial design. They're essentially, and I'll talk a little bit more about at the moment, re re reducing evidential requirements for marketing authorization. And of course, what that's leading to is greater uncertainty around the value, both in terms of cost and outcomes for our individual ecosystems. Public funders have also become much more aligned with the commercial sector. If you look at this piece of work, amazing piece of work done by Rifat Atun, you will see most of the major public funders around the world now are aligning their research portfolios in discovery science and biopharmaceuticals to the exclusion of many other areas. Now, the commercial determinants, as I said, have also increased our tolerance of putting cancer medicines into market with lower clinically meaningful benefit. Um, some work that came out of it, of Chris Booth's group that we collaborated with, showed that only 15% of RCTs for main solid cancers meet the thresholds for clinically meaningful benefit. Further work by Nathan Cherney, updated, and there's a marvellous piece of work he did here, looking at immuno-oncology drugs here. These are all the major ones. And if you look at the FDA approvals here, you will see 60% of those given authorizations as new medicines or for new indications actually score six, grade three or below. And I will say this now, that is not delivering clinically meaningful benefit. It's not to say the drug is not good in certain settings with certain patients. It's just to say generally what we're seeing now is a lot of medicines coming onto the market for which the uncertainty is great or actually they're simply not delivering clinically meaningful benefit. So there's huge complexity and heterogeneity across Europe and, and globally. And Marilise has already touched upon this. And, and the WHO technical report makes this clear. There's also a great deal of obfuscation around what is essentially market prices coming out from companies and what the price is to patients downstream. There's a tremendous amount of rent seeking occurring across Europe. And, the, and this is a really deeply complex area. What we do know is commercialism has captured a lot of the regulatory public funding ecosystems, but frankly, this is broadly part of a political tilt to wealth rather than health. Um, we do have the tools and the know-how for governance, but these aren't properly being utilized. And I would actually strongly argue, this is a failure of our professional classes as well as our markets. Um, at the end of the day, companies are set up to generate profits for their shareholders. And it's up to companies, it's up to countries and societies to put in place the right governance mechanisms. I'll touch on that again at the end. So let me just turn very briefly to the wider commercial determinants beyond um, medicines and just to pull out a few things we talked about in the paper. The first is over the last 15 years or so, we've seen a huge increase in commercial medical technology and to a lesser extent, FinTech, financial technology. And this has been particularly driven by two areas, artificial intelligence, and it's been delivered by what we call MSED. So these are blood tests for cancer. This, in this case, multi-cancer early detection tests. A lot of these are now being pushed as solutions to what are essentially systems and service level problems. And a piece of work we published in Nature many years ago with C.S. Pramish from Tata Memorial and Chris Booth made the point 
that a lot of people would like to think that technology is a magic bullet to structural and organizational problems within our individual health systems and cancer systems. They're not, but they're being pushed very, very heavily as those magic bullets. And, and in nowhere is that clear really than the, the multi-cancer early detection test. Again, huge range of med tech companies now moving into this area. There's an enormous amount of capture by industry of the R&D ecosystems, mainly because federal funding has contracted. And increasingly we're seeing, of course, lower evidential standards. And a lot of these tests probably have specific utility within selective areas of our cancer care systems, but they're being driven very much as solutions now to early detection, which of course in the round, they're not because a lot of the problems with early detection and it's already been alluded to in screening are results of failure of political will, funding, failure of organization, failure of understanding the social cultural milieu and actually doing some cultural engineering. But it's been interesting how MSEDs and these technologies have been positioned. But I, I don't want to sort of just point the finger really just at, at med tech per se. Again, in a lot of places, what's driving this, of course, is private sector cancer care. Um, private sector cancer care, of course, is, will always want to use the latest technologies. Why? Because it's very easy then to drive patient flows. We've shown this through data, for example, on robotics when they first were introduced into surgery. These drove patient flows irrespective of the quality of surgery being done. And again, again and again, you're seeing high end, often untested and unproven technologies being pushed by private sector. And that really unbalances the ecosystem. And I think there's a, there's a whole range of issues here that people really have to the mixed private public economies we have now across most of Europe. I'm going to give the last two words really firstly to Adam Smith. I mean, when he wrote The Wealth of Nations in 1776, um, he wasn't promulgating free markets and laissez-faire capitalism. He makes it extremely clear at the end of his book that when it comes to commercialism, you need to have commercialism within a well-governed system set by government. So laissez-faire capitalism has never been a solution to healthcare or cancer care. And, and I guess... You can look at this two ways. You can say, and I, and I totally agree, I think there have been some extraordinary breakthroughs, both in non-medical technologies and in medical technologies for treating cancer patients. And the world is a long, long way away from when I first started in cancer back in the late 1980s. And, and that is a, truly a marvel. But with those marvels have come serious problems in terms of putting into the market unproven or ineffective technologies and also pricing of those technologies and, and i guess it's this that you know again i point out here the commercial sector only operates within the social political parameters that we set as society you know public sector and political capture by the commercial interests of r d i think really does need to be rebalanced um we seeing an awful lot of our public research funding organizations far far too aligned to the purely wealth agenda rather than actually counterbalancing what's happening in the world at the moment and again, finally, I would say, I don't think we've got a very good discourse on what public good actually looks like in cancer for medical technologies and for cancer medicines. And that needs to change. And, and so with those final words, uh, Robert, I'll, I'll hand back to you and say thank you very much indeed. Outstanding. Uh, Richard, uh, thank you very much. Um, that was a, a, a superb uh, tour de force of the kind of geopolitical uh situation as well as um uh, you know just a, a a kind of illumination of of the market forces that are at play here I, I i really am grateful for your um insights into understanding how how this market has become so as you said turbocharged in in the last couple of decades really insightful um, understanding the the huge kind of financial ecosystem that that now exists, um, the importance of of shifting this of of reframing from wealth uh, towards health, uh, really really helpful. Uh, thank you very much for that presentation. Um, it's now my pleasure to introduce uh, Monica Kusinska um, to begin to talk about some of the solutions and the way forward. Uh, Monica is actually my colleague here at WHO headquarters. She is the global cross-cutting 
lead on economic and commercial determinants for WHO in Geneva. She was also a special guest editor for the Euro Health special issue. Um, and if I can, before handing over to Monica, if I can just remind uh, the participants, please uh, do put your questions in the chat. Um, you know, they can be for Monica, for Richard, for Marilise, for Gordon, for any of the speakers. Um, so please, please do put your questions in. After Monica's presentation, we'll have an, an open question and answer. So Monica, over to you and very much looking forward to your presentation on what next for the commercial determinants of health. Excellent. Thank you so much, Robert. And thank you very much to, to the organizers for inviting me to join you today and um, for what is an incredibly topical and a very interesting discussion. <clears throat> Sorry, excuse me. Let me just take some water. <clears throat> having <laughs> there we go. Not having spoken for an hour, I'm uh, I'm I need a little bit of lubrication. So um, so colleagues, uh, it's my great pleasure to to be with you. And what I wanted to talk about um during the fifteen minutes that I have is to give you first of all a little bit of background to the commercial determinants of health as a as a broader concept. We've we've um, discussed a lot about how this applies within the cancer space, but this is of course um, a, a very much a, a topic that is that we're seeing increasingly referenced in non-communicable diseases and elsewhere. And then I'll move to talk a little bit about the WHO work on, on commercial determinants globally, and then finally to, uh, the discussion around what's next, so how in this broader context does, the, um, does this all fit. And, and this, uh, this is very much a a discussion which is not new. And I think a lot of what we've heard so far is, is very familiar for us. Uh, what what um, Dr. Galea mentioned at the very beginning, you know, this is uh, the concept of commercial determinants is, is rooted in the long-standing decades of knowledge that we have largely in a non-communicable disease space, most notably in the, in the work against um, tobacco control, but then also more recently in, in other areas. And, and there've been three main forces that have, have moved forward conjunctively that lead us into, into clustering this as a common terminology of commercial determinants, which we've only really seen over the last 10 years or so, because that is what is new. Although the concepts that we're talking about, the topics that we're talking about are, are not new for, for us individually, putting this together under a cluster of determinants uh, and starting to see the systematic uh, overlap between different areas and how this permeates across different parts of our system is new. And this is really the, the added value and the, and the, the, the starting of the step change in thinking in terms of how we address it. That this is still a very new space. The science is still emerging. It's it's notably led by the Lancet series on commercial determinants of health that was published just in March this year. And, and many of, of the colleagues who are, who are leading global scholars in this space are amongst us, including our moderator today, Robert Martin. Um, and one of the, the points of note within this, oh sorry, there we go, is that indeed what, then what was noticed or what was different is that we're seeing a repetition of the same corporate practices, commercial practices, behaviours across different areas. But there's a second trend which is very important for us to, to recognize in this. And that is that the, there's also been an acknowledgement and recognition that of the and, and in, indeed a growing um, positioning of the private sector as a partner, as a multi-sectoral partner in health and development. And we've seen that in in, in um in uh, you know, we have that discussion in terms of pharmaceuticals and other areas today, but we're seeing that across the board, and it really is part of a of a trend as we've seen a shift of resources from the private the public sector to the private sector and but also a shift in in uh, acknowledging the role that the private sector plays in in our health and development goals and a shift in the space that it plays in, in policy making but the third trend is the the lessons that have been learned in the social determinant space and since since the health and all policies approach was um, was adopted in 2006 led by the finnish government there has been uh, increasing understanding that that the, the commercial practices are indeed some of the barriers towards implementation in, in, and in and commercial forces and commercial actors impact on all aspects of our of the social determinants. And in this context, in 2019, there was a high level strategic meeting held where WHO was, was asked to review the lessons learned and the state of play on implementation on SDH on social determinants of health and two 
areas emerged as priorities. One was on urban health. And again, I think it's it's not a coincidence that as we're seeing a rise in the uh, impact of, in, of what were formerly industrially driven epidemics uh, and the, 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 the role of urbanization within that is also growing in terms of our understanding of its impact. And the second was commercial determinants of health. And that was really the starting point of the global work on, um, on, on this area. So I was asked to initiate the program two and a half years ago. And the the mandate for this is in, within the social determinants of health. So we have two resolutions on, and one declaration, which basically ask us as WHO Secretariat that, to look at this within the context of the inequitable distribution of power, money and resources, mindful of the important role that the private sector has placed, but while safeguarding a conflict of interest within that. And the global program, it really aims to build on existing WHO work and evidence uh, being led by the work at the regional level, at country level, covering the spectrum of corporate behavior from supply chains to regulatory influence and maintaining this social determinants focus within the context of power, equity and governance. And we have four main areas of activity coordinating in, within WHO. Of course, this is very, um, this is emerging in different ways. And I'll talk about that a little bit in, in uh, a little bit later on, convening the community of practice and, and dialogue that's ongoing externally, advocacy and of course, then building tools and capacity. So, so the problem analysis, what we're trying to work with here, and we have a theory of change, is that we really need to leverage the power and potential of the commercial sector to improve health outcomes and health equity, but protect from conflicts of interest and, and public health harm. And then there are two assumptions that are very important within this. The first one is that, that business is, is very good at being business. It does it very well. And that commercial actors are obliged to continue practices that prioritize their profits over health and other important determinants of health, unless they're required to do so. And this is very important. This is not good guys, bad guys, but this is a, a rational behavior of commercial actors within a system that is designed um, to, to function the way that it does. But the second part of that assumption is that this, the negative impacts of commercial determinants of health come from power asymmetries and misaligned incentives, because of course, commercial actors are uh, operate within an environment. They are also bound by institutional rules and, and forces. And this, these are themselves products of broader economic determinants of health. And you may have noticed that the program is economic and commercial determinants in total. And this may be a little bit theoretical for, for those of us, particularly in, in those of you who are working in a very applied space and see the reality of, of this, these imbalances. But it's very important when it comes to fulfilling our mandate to synthesize the global evidence and to provide evidence informed recommendations for action. So the, the bulk of the work is, is indeed that. It's concentrated around the Commercial Determinants of Health Global Report. It's the first time that we will have done something uh, in, this, in this scale and of this area, where the objectives is to really uh, the clarify our, our common concepts normatively on, and uh, the terminology on commercial determinants, present the case for action, synthesize the global evidence and then provide these evidence and form recommendations for action. And just to give you a, a sense of this work is still ongoing, so this may um, change and, and will no doubt evolve, but there are four main areas of inquiry that are emerging from the, the work of the last two and a half years. The first is that the, the equity matters, no surprise to us, but maintaining the equity lens on outcomes when we think about commercial determinants is, is critical and the distribution of health is is an essential starting point um, for, for, the, for the, the public health inquiry. The identification and management of conflict of interest is the is uh, remains key and central to the work as it goes on. Identifying and attributing externalities and particularly negative externalities, and this uh, and this is very succinctly put by both Mary Lisa and, and Richard. The, the burden here is borne by health systems, by societies, by communities, by individuals, but the, the rewards are, are privatized. The rewards are, are largely um, are in, the, in the profit margin and in the profit space. And that in itself is linked or is rooted within these broader economic and financial environments. We've heard already about financialization and, uh, and, and looking at how these broader economic incentives lay out and influence us um, across the different policy arenas is, is a critical dimension of that. 
So the work so far has focused largely the external facing work on advocacy. And as I've included some that here, I'm not going to go into that in detail. But one thing that I did want to pick up is the, the work across the different regions, because the, of course we, we're focused today on cancer control. We could take any entry point, any lens um, on within the, the broader disease burden and, and we will see the commercial determinants dimension in it. There's increasing work, for example, on AMR and commercial drivers of, of um, antimicrobial resistance. Um, there, and uh, just to give you one set of examples. And as uh, as part of, uh, of our attempt to understand how this, this has uh, emerged, how the narrative is developing, but also where the evidence lies, we commissioned six regional scoping reviews together with the Alliance for Health Policy and Health Systems Research in order to, to, to answer some of the questions around how, the, how this is moving forward and how our broader public health community is conceptualizing some of these issues. And together with other parts of the scoping, other other in, we have an internal mapping process and other uh, internal and um, desk review processes that I'm not going into detail. There are some distinct um, similarities and differences that emerge that I just wanted to, to to flag here. So the first one is with regards to differences. If we're looking at differences, there's some um, distinct industry differences. For example, small arms emerge as a priority industry in the, the Latin, um, sorry, forgive me, in the Americas, um, both in North America, but also in the Caribbean and South America. The extractive industry becomes very important for the African region, um, but also in, in the South American region. The garment industry is very important in the Southeast Asian industry, all of as in Southeast Asian region, and all of these have, have uh, distinct implications for health and health equity. Um, in the European context, for example, the role of the EU, which of course is, is unique um, globally as a body, is very important. The role of trade acts uh, very differently, particularly if we're looking at small countries versus larger countries. The role of debt in relation to a country's ability to build um, public sector capabilities and capacities. Uh, and the role of, of state capability in litigation. So this is just some of the differences that emerge from, from, our, from our work in these different areas, but there are some distinct similarities that come through. So notably in the, in the food industry, and if we're looking at similarity in industries, the pharmaceutical industry, and some similarity in alcohol, tobacco, and gambling, depending on, on uh, the regional context. And last but not least, in terms of some similarities, vulnerability. So across the board, we can see that um, in, in high-income countries and low- and middle-income countries, it is the the most vulnerable within our communities who are affected the most uh, the indigenous communities for example and uh, that we have a common set of commercial practices in uh, impacting on public health policies and access to common goods so moving on to what's next for commercial determinants for, uh, this the last part of what i wanted to talk to you about here and, and I, I come back to the lancet series i mentioned it at the beginning of the presentation it was mentioned before and the, the this really is is a sort of watershed moment for our understanding of just the scale of impact and implicate implement uh, implication that we have here the lancet series proposed that just four industries together account for at least one third of global deaths each year. And, and this is likely to be far more if uh, with many of these occurring prematurely. And, and indeed many out of the remaining two thirds is known, there's no doubt that many more are also contributed to by commercial practice. And in fact, it's very difficult for us to look at any of the main public health crises of the 21st century without being able to identify commercial practices, either exploiting or indeed directly causing some of them. And, and some within the, the group of scholars, and I quote here Professor Nick Freudenberg, really are positioning commercial determinants as the leading cause of global burden and disease and threats to planetary health will stop. So in, in trying to address this, that and, and Gowden has mentioned some areas, Marilise and, uh, and Richard, others, but really what we need to think about as a public health community is, is as a priority, ensuring that commercial practices enable health promoting environments and therefore by def definition, prevent health harming environments. And indeed preventing and limiting commercial practices, including corporate social responsibility and manipulation of investment mechanisms that negatively impact 
not only our physical environments, but also our information environments and our access to public health goods and services is, is going to be crucial. And within that, the minimization of the political and related practice that undermine and distort public health policy. And this is very, very, very clear, even though it is very hard to do. But it's also not going to be enough. We need to look at more big picture action. So addressing health harming industries themselves, the misaligned incentives which allow them to uh, exert negative externalities in the health and health equity space and overpowering the power of some asymmetries between commercial actors and private se uh, public sector um, within that. And this, uh, what is emerging is sort of within sort of three main areas of activity, governance of health impacting commercial actors and practices, making the public sector an agent for change and protecting public policy, and then empowering, protecting, and enabling other potentially health aligned actors, including civil societies. I'm not going to go into that detail. And so the, there are five main drivers of change within here. So working across government and public sector actors. So the public interventions, whether they're regulatory interventions, fiscal interventions, uh, and, uh, and normative interventions as, as a priority, and it remains a priority. The best buys, for example, are, are clear. And, uh, and then looking at how these are prevented from implementation, including um, uh, the, the conflicts of interest points that I mentioned and others have mentioned as well. And number two, and this Marilise referred to at the beginning as well, corporate governance and investor action. So looking at the business community and investor community and those actors that are active within that to strengthen the accountability on commercial actors and businesses and, and enable those that are health are health aligned or who, who have the potential for being health aligned to be able to do so. The third is the, the role of multilateral processes, international instruments and financing. And we've seen the important role that the FCTC, the framework, WHO Framework on Prevention of Tobacco Control has played in this space. And there are many others, including some in, in process, the UN, um, the <clears throat> The UN tax discussions, for example, um, um, which were uh, looking at how multinational tax contributions are, are going to be planning out the open ended working group of member states who are exploring a global instrument on business and transnational corporations and human rights, for example. But then also the public interest knowledge environment. We know that the and and we we have so it's, it's come up in the presentations before that the the impact on research, the 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 role of commercial actors in disinformation and misinformation, looking at ourselves and our own conflicts of interest and our knowledge um, environments in more broadly is is going to be very important. And this is something that we can do as a public health community. And then finally, the, the working towards greater public demand for better corporate practices, which of course help shape the, the broader environment and enable all the other actions. So with that, Robert, I'm going to pass back to you, but I do have some additional resources uh, that I've included here that should, in any if anyone would like to take a screenshot or, or um, would like to pursue that further. Fantastic. Superb. Monica, thank you very much uh, for that overview um, of, of both the topic, but also of, of what you are doing and what you're leading uh, from the WHO side. I, I, I think that's extremely important, extremely interesting. Very glad to see that the uh, world report is coming together and, and looking uh, forward to that. I think that will be a, a landmark um, uh, achievement and, and output. I think that will really, you know, put this agenda uh, issue on the agenda for, for many countries, um, you know, who are trying to move towards uh, creating these, as you say, health promoting environments. And, and I also very much appreciate the focus on, you know, kind of governance and strengthening the public sector and, and empowering, uh, others to, to be part of a, a, a broader response. So, Thank you very much. Um, very, very helpful. Um, colleagues, uh, this has been fantastic. I mean, I think we've heard from Monica now, we've heard from Richard, uh, we've heard from Mary Lise, we've heard from Gordon. Um, I've learned a lot. Um, you know, I, I I've I've done some work on on commercial determinants, but never have I gone uh as far in in depth on cancer specifically. So I've I've really enjoyed uh the presentation. 
comments and the discussion. I see that we still are waiting on some questions in the chat, although there is one which I'm going to just read and then I'm going to maybe add some of my own. And then maybe what we can do is is kind of have a round um, with with each of the panelists. So one of the questions that we have is, is that um, LMICs often lack the capacity to weed, weed out what can deliver meaningful outcomes from what's hyped up by industry and even subject matter experts. The guidance put out by WHO, academic bodies, and others often do not keep up with the rapid pace of pharma and tech development. So what's your advice for countries and individuals who would like to initiate an objective scientific mechanism in their own country? So Richard, I think that question is intended for you, but I think uh, I'm sure Monica, Marlies, uh, you have some thoughts as well. Um, uh, uh, maybe a broader question, and I think all of you have begun to, 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 to talk to this, but maybe if I could push you a little bit further too, I mean, I think, you know, the the discourse on commercial determinants, I think in the last uh, few years has, has made, uh, you know, tremendous progress. I, I think, you know, the academic literature has, has really exploded, if I may say, in, in the last couple of years. Um, but as you, you were saying, Monica, that we still don't quite have a, a kind of global understanding, a global, a globally kind of coherent um, conceptualization of this. And, and obviously that limits our ability to move right and to provide kind of policy guidance on specific interventions um ways of addressing this for policymakers and so i was just you know one question for all of you building on on this question is is how can we accelerate that process right i think uh, all of you have talked about the need to better understand this issue to illuminate the the kind of challenge to to bring a spotlight, and I, I I think that's very important. Obviously, um, all of us are are trying to do that, but but I think that's not enough, right? I I think we need to accelerate um a a, a kind of transition to to providing concrete advice, concrete um guidance to countries to policymakers about how to address this and. Obviously, that's that's really difficult. So, it would be very interested to to hear your thoughts on on how we might be able to do that. So, who wants to start? Do you want to kick off then? Maybe give you a... Richard. Go ahead. Okay. Look, I think this is this is this is the million dollar question. I think, in a sense, the pharmaceuticals is is more tractable than the med tech area. So there are countries that have been heading down what I would consider to be health technology assessment light or modified approaches. National Cancer Grid of India, for example, have engaged in this. And, you know, so there are, have to be mechanisms either the hospital level or the federal level or the network level to help shape priorities and decisions around this. And of course, it also then helps shape your procurement strategy. So again, the NCG of India have done some superb work in joint procurement for the hospitals that are part of this. You know, the CS Pramish and others have led on this. <laughs> Excuse me. And we've seen the same in Thailand as well and other countries. But the problem is when you get into med tech, which is really, you know, the evidence base for a lot of med tech is super thin. And I include here surgical robots, MIS, et cetera. And also the thinness of when you're dealing with big ticket items like types of radiotherapy. Because it, you know, if something is proven not to be cost effective or affordable in medicines, you could take it off the shelf. If you built a bunker and put a new piece of kit in there, it's very hard digging it up afterwards and saying, you know what, this was a waste of time. And more broadly, there are normative guidances. We've got the WHO essential medicines list. But again, what is essential of essential it is a is a moot point. And generally, our experience is a lot of countries and places. The issue is the capacity and capability to put together proper procurement planning systems in order to be able to put to actually deliver this sort of affordable care. And, and the failure often comes is there's just simply one or two people dealing with this in any particular country. But it is a much, much more complicated situation. And, and frankly, a lot of high income countries haven't got it right either. 
you know, we've waved through artificial intelligence in this country just like that. No real HTA oversight. Anyway, that's just a few thoughts. No, excellent, uh, Richard. Thank you very much. I I, I think that's already a, a helpful uh, start. Uh, the challenge of med tech, um, but thinking about this in terms of yeah, health tech assessment or. Uh, you know, looking at the experience of of high tap in in Thailand, others, but I think it is broader, as you say. I think it's it's part of a kind of priority setting exercise, right? That that governments are looking at, and you know, how do you address interests from different groups, right? Um, you you need to be able to have some sort of mechanism uh, to to be able to weigh these issues, but it is challenging, uh, particularly. Uh, when viewed uh, in the context of all the other challenges facing, uh, you know, governing bodies, uh, ministries or, or regulatory bodies. And in fact, it often, unfortunately, is just one or two people that are ultimately having to to make these decisions. So really, really challenging. Um, Marilise, Monica, I see your hand is raised. Please go. Unless Marilise wanted to go before. No. Um, so I, I wanted to to fully agree with Richard, so on on a couple of points. The first one is, and in response to the person who puts the question in, this isn't exclusively an issue that's faced by low and middle income countries. Certainly, high income countries have not got this right, and in some cases, are doing worse across certain areas. And and being able to protect public policy and decision making from commercial influence. So I think I think this is I think you know we are dealing with an issue which is which is common to all. And one of the thing that the one of the pieces of work that we've undertaken is, is a listening exercise with member states. So we've spoken at the moment to just under 50 member states to ask them what, what they need. And they have responded perhaps in, in a slightly unsurprising way that, you know, this is a complex issue and therefore we need a different, we need um, uh, multiple tracks of action, including that at the international on um, the multilateral level, that a lot of what we're talking about won't be addressed just through national policy. And indeed, there's a limit to the effectiveness of that, even when everything is going perfectly. These are these are issues that are that are transnational, that are international and multilateral in nature. These are actors that are have bigger um, purchasing and power capacity than and a great number of our member states. So we need to have concerted effort across different areas in order to be able to move the needle on something which has you know, it has exploded over the last decades in terms of of the impact it's having across our health and health. Uh, um, ish, uh, impacts. And one point I would say is that some of these things are industry specific or particular area specific, but some of these things are actually the, the, the governance relationship that we have with commercial actors full stop. And we have, and, and so start looking at this as a systemic issue that has implications for pharmaceutical policy, for, for medical device policy, but also other areas is, is, is critically important. We, we, we're not going to be able to do this alone, actually. It's essential that we do this in a way that's concerned across the different parts of the health community. Mm, superb, Monica, as always, uh, very incisive. I, I, I wholeheartedly agree. I mean, we do need a systems lend. We we need to bring in other actors. We need to, to find ways. And as you said, it's, and also Richard said, it's it's not just a high income country. I think this cuts a, across countries and and we see every country, I think, grappling with this this challenge. Uh, Marilis, I wanted to come to you if you had any um, comments or reflections. Well, uh, almost everything has been said, but um, I can add on a very practical um, aspect uh, when we go to countries and we are faced with the, this, this, this situation. It's it's really uh, we we help country to prioritize. That's really the 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 way to 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 tackle this. So um, we don't have you know uh, uh, WHO guidance on on products, but we have WHO guidance on how to prioritize. For example, uh, on screening, uh, we published uh, recently. Uh, screening guides, uh, screening for cancer, and also a costing tool, because at the end of the day, to prioritize, you need to see the cost eff effectiveness in your setting, because all these new things, they cost a lot. So can you afford it? But especially, see how, how much benefit you will get from that. And you know, if you put your money elsewhere, 
it may be better. So, you know, to countries who say, oh, we absolutely need uh, lung cancer screening. We say, well, where, how is our cervical cancer screening program? How, we, how does it perform? How, may, how many people are screened? So, you know, this, this uh, cervical cancer screening, it works very well. It saves very a lot of life for a minimal cost. Uh, you will never get the same uh, the same result with lung cancer screening. So first, focus on on cervical cancer, and then then put your money somewhere else. Uh, that's the way we, um, we 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 deal with that on a very uh, practical, uh, you know, way. Very nice, uh, Marilyn. It's very helpful, insightful. I think I think that's right. It is about priority setting. And, and we know countries are doing this either explicitly or implicitly, right? Uh, countries may not always have an explicit process, but but they're doing it, uh, right? And and um, I, I think, you know, all of us do that in, in the way that we work, right? We set priorities even if we don't have a process uh, by what we choose to do, right? Um, and and where and how we choose to work is is the result of a priority setting exercise, whether it's our to-do lists or we have a, a strategy, uh, you know, and it's it's important to just illuminate this and, and bring attention to this. So thank the you issue, very much. The issue is that because of commercial determinants, uh, countries really don't prioritize well. Some countries really make big mistakes. Yeah. Not mistake. You know, they prioritize uh, what their, uh, the companies want and not what... Absolutely. I, I think the, the, the challenge is, is when you have an implicit process, it is very... Uh, easy to de distract or distort that process and the priorities, right? And it makes it open to industry interference. And I think that's what we've begun to, to illuminate here. So uh, that question was from Sanjeeva Gunasakara. Uh, forgive me if I'm not pronouncing that quite name, the, the, quite right, but thank you very much uh, for that question. I see we have also um, a hand raised from Sona Sendarakova. Sona, would you like to make a comment or a question? Is that why you have your hand raised? If we could maybe make a Sona. Yes, Sona, go ahead. Please introduce yourself and then make your comment or question. Sona? Sona, are you able to speak? Ah, you're sorry it was a mistake. Okay, no problem. <laughs> that happens. Um, I see another uh, kind of comment from, from the chat here that, that cancer tends to evoke strong feelings from the public, understandably. But how do we handle, navigate, negotiate public and media demand for the best cancer drugs on offer, especially when the availability of these is sometimes seen as a marker of good modern health systems, right? So I think this is a kind of follow on comment from, from the previous discussion, right? How how do we balance this, uh, the these challenges? Any any further reflections, Monica? Yes, I see your hand. So I, I didn't um, I didn't cover this in my presentation, but um, but it was due due to time. But I think this is this is really you know when we talk about the so the the demand or the consumer demand or the the public demand, whatever it is that we're talking about here. It's it's critical that we and and in fact in any part of our conversation, it's very critical that we think about the role of of the different actors that we have around the table and and if I, if I can revert back to our sort of five components the role of civil society and public health civil society in in um in this public narrative is, is absolutely critical and we've seen that in other areas um, not uh, not only in the pharmaceutical space um, but we've seen that in tobacco and in alcohol that that industry funded often industry um supported actors and well-meaning actors in that space as well who will of course make very compelling very passionate arguments for a particular position which is not necessarily the the um sort of evidence-based or the, the public health position that that public discourse supporting civil society voices and seeing civil society as fundamental to governing commercial determinants of health investing in civil society ensuring that civil society spaces are free from conflict of interest that we know who we're talking to are those that are that are um, legitimate representatives of, of whoever it is that we're talking about that is it's fundamental and that 
in go some way towards the the uh, to the shaping of public narratives or public policy narratives which are then then um, going to be uh, reflecting the evidence and the needs across the broader population and not only from the, from those that are that are industry um, voices or industry groups super I thank you may Monica. say robert um just yeah, to follow up, i think from a clinical perspective it is very very challenging um, if you ask patients and, and you say once a drug or something has a marketing authorization or CMR, the, the implicit assumption is this must be useful for you in some way. And, and the problem is, I think there's been a fair amount of obfuscation, dare I say it, even dishonesty from the sort of professional communities here about the limits of our of our of so-called innovation. And, and we've not been very good about challenging ourselves and our organizations about what we're truly delivering into 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 clinical practice and what sort of risks and benefits those have. Now, obviously, if you are being treated in a, in a system which is well governed by medical oncologists or clinical oncologists or surgeons that have no particular economic interest in putting pushing any technologies, those individuals will help guide patients through the right path. If you are unfortunate to be in a system where that's not the case, then you will be over-treated, under-treated, mistreated. So, but we have a problem here at the moment is that we're just not challenging the prevailing ecosystem in a manner which brings patients along. And we've been lousy about engaging patient organizations and, and the general public in unpicking the real complexity around this. Because as I said before, you can't tar all the drugs and all the med tech with the same brush. There are some outstanding pieces of new technology, but those only get situated in, in a system of intelligent kindness that we actually treat patients well. They are simply just a small tool in the overall approach to treating our curative and metastatic patients. But we've been really, really lousy in engaging with, with, the, with, with patient organizations and patients on this. Um, and, and I think that needs to be changed. And I'm afraid a lot of professional organizations I'm going to say them now, all the big ones, the ASCOs, the ESMOs, et cetera. I've watched over the years as they've increasingly withdrawn from having these sorts of public dialogues about affordability, sustainability, really clinically meaningful benefit, et cetera. And that's for a whole host of reasons. And that needs to be changed. Excellent. Thank you so much, Richard. And thank you for that question, comment, uh, Savanti Wild. Uh, very glad to have that. Um, we have about five, ten minutes left. Merlis, uh, do you please go ahead? Yeah, yeah. No, I just wanted to to add to Richard that uh, indeed the um, involvement with patient organization is very uh, is very important at WHO. We plan to to do that more mm. um, because uh, it's it's important. And another also a practical aspect is to make harms risk. Um, more uh, visible. Uh, I, I work more in screening, but um, you know, risk of this new screening are not known yet. Um, so it's also something that uh, any lay person can understand. There is benefit, but there is also risk in new things you don't know very well. Indeed, thank you, Marlies. Uh, glad to hear that, and and encouraged to hear that that you'll be working more with with patient advocacy groups. I think that's really important. Um, I, my colleague uh, Maria La Sierra Losada has just put in the chat. If you'd like to raise your a question live, uh, you're most welcome to raise your hand, and and we will give you the floor. So, uh, colleagues, participants, uh, you're very much encouraged. Uh, you know, if you don't want to write a, your question in the chat, uh, please feel free to raise your hand. Um, we have a bit of time left, not not a lot. Um, if I don't see any questions or comments, then maybe I'll just ask our panelists if they want to offer kind of some parting, parting words or something that they weren't able to share in their presentation, um, some kind of challenges uh, that they see important for the future or uh, kind of um, uh, queries that they are thinking that they need help from uh, participants on. Uh, Colleagues, do you want to maybe offer any parting thoughts, questions, challenges from your side? Monica, do you want to start? Thank you. Yes, sorry, just I'm trying to find the unmute button there. Um, yes, yeah, so, so 
one thing that I wanted to very much leave us with from my side is that that despite the this can be quite overwhelming, you know, when, when we start to think about commercial determinants in its broader sense, but also when we, you know, in in, in a particular field, such as in the cancer control space, this is, it, it can, and I've seen this happen, your colleagues are overwhelmed by the scale of the, the issue, right? and particularly when we think about this in global terms. But I remain utterly hopeful, you know, in, in my 25 years of public health practice, I, I have in, you know, this is the first time that I've seen us as a public health community in its broader sense engage in this issue in a way that is that is uh, showing the visibility of the challenge that we have in front of us, addressing this in a systemic and a structured way. And, and this is really when we are at our best as a community, applying public health science, public health approaches to the uh, to what is a systemic problem. And, I, and I, so I remain hopeful and I really don't want us to 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 become overwhelmed by something and, and see this as something that isn't isn't addressable by us. We're an incredibly um, uh powerful community with a number of levers at our disposal both within our own space within our own sector but also with within a broader public discourse and i think challenging some of the fundamental issues that we're seeing at the center of it because this is this is critical to achieving all of our gains every single one of us in the public health community regardless of what we're working on is here because we believe in social justice and we believe in improving the lives of our patients and our communities and this is really fundamentally what we're talking about here in this area so as a as, as a as perhaps a little bit broader than i intended but i think that's very important for us to to take away this is this is not the end this is the very much the beginning and and we are uh, we all have a role every single one of us regardless of where we're sitting has a role to to address it and to take this forward super thank you very much monica um richard marilise marilise richard final thoughts parting shots um Maybe I want to say to uh, everybody here to uh, participate in the awareness raising effort. That's something you can do. First, you can do for yourself is to uh, educate you on uh, commercial determinants. It's a lot of fun. And uh, as soon as you begin to grab, and it goes very fast, actually, you, you begin to see it everywhere and you understand much more better the world where you are in. So really have it just for, for the fun of it. And, um, and yes, raise awareness around you just by, you know, uh, um, raising or, uh, or publication, and uh, as many people will have not uh, time to read any publication, you know, this webinar will be uh, available. And there is also a webinar that was uh, done of uh, less than one hour uh, when we released this publication, and we will give uh, the, um, the, the link. Super. Thank you, Marilise. Excellent. Uh, Richard? I, it's fun if I, I would like to just see a lot more health policy and service research, implementation science research, health economics, political economy embedded into our research into innovation, whether these are clinical trials of pharma, med tech, anything like this. And, and the problem moment is, you know, neither the commercial sector nor public funding bodies are really supporting these areas. And personally, I would say to the commercial sector, it's in their interest to have a sustainable future and a sustainable system. And I think without this sort of research, we're just not going to be able to furnish policymakers with the range of options they're going to need to make those sorts of decisions. And that's quite aside from building capacity and capability to make these decisions across countries. And, and that would make a massive difference to rebalancing the ecosystem at the moment, because that simply isn't happening. Excellent. No, thank you. It is superb. Uh, Richard, really helpful. And Maybe just to say from from my side, I, I actually can say at the Alliance for Health Policy and Systems Research, uh, we are looking increasingly at, at the commercial determinants and, and beginning, uh, you know, in close collaboration with Monica, but also others uh, to develop a new uh, plan of work here on the research agenda around commercial determinants. So um, I, I hope we'll be able to share more details on that in the future. Um, I've been really enjoying this discussion. Um, thank you very much. I've learned a lot, uh, a lot of insights, a lot of um, um, new knowledge for me. So thank you very much. Um, I found it indeed inspiring. 
Um, as as you said, Monica, it can be sometimes overwhelming when you begin, and Marilise, when you said you you begin to see it, you can't unsee it, right? It's one of those things that it's like all of a sudden you you go from black and white to color, and and you see all of these connections, and it it can be challenging. But I think we are beginning to get to a place where we can be more structured, where we can be more systemic. I also hope that we can get to a place where we are setting the agenda, right? I, I think a lot of times what we're finding here is that we can identify, we can illuminate, we can spotlight what the industry is doing, but we're often responding, right? And we're saying, oh, the industry is doing this. We need to think about doing that. I hope, you know, in the, in the coming years, decades, we can be in a spot where we are setting the agenda and the industry is then responding to us. And I think at this point, we're still... Um, a little bit of ways from that, right? Um, but I, 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 I'm hopeful, and I think you know our community is strong. I think it is growing. I'm, I'm very hopeful uh, that that we can get to a place and space where where we are defining, setting the agenda, uh, creating the the regulations, and and putting the safeguards in place to, to to move from wealth to health. So. Thank you very much, uh, Marilise. Thank you very much, Richard. Thank you, Monica. Thank you also, uh, my colleague, Maria La Sierra Losada, who has helped to, to really bring this together, make sure that this session is smooth and insightful. Thank you to all of you for participating, for joining uh, the last 90 minutes. I hope it's been a helpful, um, insightful, uh, inspiring conversation. Um, and at that, with that in mind, I'd like to hand over back. I'd like to hand the floor back to my colleague Yulia, who I think has some final words. Yulia, back to you. Thank you very much, Robert. Indeed, um, I would like to uh, just to take this opportunity and um, to thank again, uh, first of all, on behalf of um, every one of us uh, to Euro uh, Concert Team for hosting this wonderful session. It was very, very interesting and very insightful. I would like to uh, thank London Global Cancer Week team for hosting us uh, today and giving us uh, five hours of uh, time and this platform to be here. Um, last but not least, I want to thank um, to everyone who made this um, wonderful webinar happening and sort of behind the scenes, so to our IT team, to our admin team, and of course uh, to all, all of you who stayed with us the whole um, webinar or some of its parts, to all the panelists, all the speakers, to all the moderators, uh, thank you so much uh, for, for your time today and for being present and being active. And uh, we look forward to having you with us next, uh, next year. Thank you. Have a lovely rest of the day. So with this, I would like to stop uh, sharing and also to stop this uh, webinar. All the best to all of you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.